Welcome to the DQS new auditor onboarding training. In this section, we're going to talk about auditor mandate calculations. One of the most critical steps in the pre-planning phase of the audit is ensuring we do the right mandates. DQS has developed some calculators in Excel format to help us do this. They are referred to as QF0900-09. They are available in the quality manual form section that we just went through in the previous part of this orientation. When you go to do an audit, the previous calculator is provided in the package so you can see what the mandate calculation was based upon. As an auditor going into a site, you are responsible for ensuring that this uh, calculation is still accurate. The first part of the form is standard company info. The major and key part of this form is understanding the employee headcount. It must be verified in the planning stage when you're putting together the agenda with the client. And again, at the beginning of the audit, the very first thing you do after the opening meeting should be a confirmation of the headcount. The second part of the form is a listing of the potential adjustment factors for the mandates. And in a little bit, we're going to go through an actual form. As an auditor, you can approve reductions up to 20%. So that's a 0.8 multiplier with a justification. Reductions above 20%, but less than 30, require a manager's approval. And if we're going to go above 30%, it must be approved by a vice president. Cases of above 30% reduction are very rare. The third part of the form is a resultant calculation for the registration, surveillance, and recertification. If any part of the QF turns yellow, it means that some number is off and a manager re approval is required. At the bottom of the form, you're going to see some important tabs. And these tabs have to do with multi-site and clubbing. I'm going to talk a little bit about what those terms mean. First, we need to define the difference between a site and a remote location. A site is a location that carries out production processes or service provision processes associated with the scope of the registration. A remote location is a location at which production or service provision associated with the scope does not occur, but the location provides some support function to the site. So a normal scenario might be you have a headquarters located at one address that does design and sales, and then you have a series of manufacturing sites that actually manufacture the product. The headquarters would be a remote location, and those manufacturing sites would be the sites. Corporate registrations are afforded further reductions in some programs due to commonality in the quality management system. In some programs, you may actually be able to do site or remote location sampling. Defining all the addresses where activity occurs is essential in setting up a corporate scheme and really is essential in setting up any sort of registration. You need to know all the addresses. You need to know what occurs at those addresses. One note of caution, if you are setting up a corporate scheme with a client, it has one major downside. If one site fails, the whole certificate can be suspended. You cannot separate out that one site from the certificate. Our mandate calculator will calculate the total amount of days required for a site. That site may be supported by remote locations. The mandate calculator does not separate the amount of days from the resultant number that are going to be given to the site versus the remote location. There's no hard and fast rule for that. The lead auditor is the one who makes that determination. In the initial setup, it's generally done by sales and confirmed by a lead auditor. 
Another term we have to talk about is clubbing. Clubbing is a situation where a client may have two or more sites uh, that they want to band together to attain a, a reduction in the number of days. Almost always, if you quote a site separately based on the employee count, it's going to be more ex expensive than if you join two together. Manager approval is required for all clubbing situations, and some programs don't allow it. For locations to be clubbed, they have to have a common management rep, they have to have a common financial system, they have to have a common management system, and they need to be in close proximity. It is, again, very rare that we will club locations. And generally, these situations are you have a campus situation where you'll have a number of sites that have different physical addresses, but they're all kind of co-located. So instead of issuing them separate certificates or corporate registration, um, under some schemes like ISO 9000, we can club them and issue them all one certificate. I'm going to show you now what the QF looks like. So here's an active one. This is the BR number. This is a scope, manufacturer of chemical stuff, or chem guys. Their standard is ISO 9000, and the number of employees is 136. Their surveillance frequency is annual, and there's their SIT code. Their EA code would be 12. The next part of the form are all the different reductions that can be allowed. So you would state why you want to give a reduction. You notice up here, their scope says the manufacturer of something. They are not design responsible. If they were, that would be the design and manufacturer of something. And we'll talk about scope writing in the next section, section seven. So this assessor or salesperson uh, put down what they thought the reductions were gonna be. The resultant reduction that they allowed was 0.9. So a 10% reduction. The calculator calculated that for a stage one and stage two, the initial assessment, they needed seven and a half days. Their annual surveillance would be three and their recertification days would be five. Now let's go back up here. I'm going to change the head count. We're going to say instead of 136, it's 266. Okay, let's come down here. And we're going to see what happened. This used to be 7.5, and now we're 8.5. This used to be 5, and now we're 5.5. So the tool itself is doing the math for us. I'm going to go back up here and put us back to 136. Okay, I'm going to show you the tabs at the bottom of this form. Oops, let's shrink that back down. Okay. Let's see if we can get this up here for you. Okay, so at the bottom of the form, you see some tabs. You see annex, mandate tables. You don't need to do anything. So the tabs you're interested in are going to be multi-site. So I'm going to click that. In a multi-site situation, this is, will be generated generally through sales. You have all the different sites, their locations, and their employee counts. And then you have the remote locations. Remember, a site is where something is being manufactured or service provision is happening. A remote location is supporting a site. The other tab you'll be interested in is the clubbing tab. Chem guys are a club situation. So let's look at the clubbing tab. They have three facilities. These are the addresses. These are the BR numbers. These are the employee counts. So what you can see from this is you have one, two, one, three. They're not manufacturing anything. They're really a remote location. You have facility one, that is cutting fabric. That is a production process. So they are a site. You have facility two, they're selling things. So that is a site. Product is shipped out of this location. You look at the addresses, 1800 Mason Court, 1840 Mason Court, now you see over here, 1600 Williams Drive, Lakemore. So these are in different towns. However, if you were to look on the map, you would find that they're co-located. They're within a couple miles of each other. Here we noted that. Now, another thing to note here is the employee count. If we were to sum these up, we'd have 
roughly. Now we don't have to be rough, we can do it. 266 employees. Now you note that back on the main page, we only had a 136. What I'm showing you is actually a discrepancy that was found in the review process. So the main page should have been updated to match this page or vice versa. Because had we put the 266 in, we would have had the 8.5 days for the certification. And if we only did seven and a half days based on the 136, we would have a non-conformance and have to go back to visit the client in order to uh, issue a registration. So that's a short demonstration of what the QF form looks like. I highly urge you as you go through your candidate auditorship to spend some time talking to the lead about the QF, make sure you understand how it works. That completes the section on mandate calculation. In the next section, we're gonna talk about doing auditings for DQS, and I'm gonna go through a few tips. Thank you.